Good morning. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you're right and ready for the body of Christ to be joined as the body of Christ. Today we're going to pray and talk about the compassion as taught by Jesus. If you have your Bibles, you will want to get them ready for John chapters 13 and 14 and 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, which we will get into later. It seems to me that as the pandemic is beginning to unfold, there are other things we need to think about, and that is how is the body of Christ going to get back together? What's the church going to look like once it's back together? Don't think for one minute that things aren't different. They are. You can't go through experiences like this and not have changes, differences. So the question is, what will those changes look like? What will those changes be? How will they unfold? Only God knows. First today, let's pray. Almighty, holy God, we come to you at this time and this place, bringing forth your word to the hearts and minds of those that will Listen with their hearts and minds. Father, I pray you open them up. You open them up to receive what it is that you would have them receive, that they would be fruitful as you count fruitful, that they will be compassionate as you teach compassion. Bless our time together today, Lord. May all we do and say bring glory to you. In your son's name we pray, amen. Compassion is what we're going to be talking about today. The first thing new is to get our arms around what is compassion. If you look up a definition for something of that nature, it's the quality of showing kindness or favor. It's the quality of understanding someone else's suffering. It's the quality of being gracious. It's the quality of having pity or mercy. In John chapters 13 through 17 could be labeled our Lord's farewell message to his beloved disciples, climaxing in his intercessory prayer for them and for us. Today, we're going to hone in on chapters 13 and 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4, as I stated. But before we go there, I want us to be blessed by a song that speaks about the worthiness of of our Lord and Savior. Sung this morning for us by Douglas Carter, he is worthy. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? 
at a good teaching technique and that good teaching technique would be one of good examples and I don't know any better teacher in all of history than Jesus Christ and today we're going to use his teaching uh, of, as an example for us on his teachings of compassion so I've got them outlined for you um, if you have your notepad the first thing we want to look at is Jesus was compassionate in his teachings, compassionate in his teachings. In verse chapter 13, verse 1. And now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What a statement. What a statement. If you're going to be a teaching, one of the best things to do is start off with establishing your relationship to those that are listening. That's what Jesus is doing. He's telling them that he loves them. And no matter what, he's going to love them to the end. Good teachers let their students know how they feel about them. On the other hand, to some people, he just explained. Run your finger down to verse 12 through verse 17. And, he, and so when he washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an, here it comes, an example that you should do as I do, did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if... You do them. So in this particular scenario here, this, the last is taking place at the Lord's Supper. He's washing their feet and he's, he's just explaining to them what he's done and why he's done it. However, to others, we back up a few verses to verses 6 through 9. People like Peter, well, you have to be a little more kinetic in your teaching, a little more dynamic, if you will. In verse 6, and so he came to Simon Peter who said to them, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall hereafter, you shall understand hereafter. 
Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered and said to him, If I do not wash you, you will have no part of me. In other words, you won't participate with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. That was Peter's personality. As a student, he needed a more direct approach, a more individualistic approach. Friends, teaching and learning is based in the students. You may believe that you're a great teacher, but if the students are not learning, there is a serious disconnect, no matter what other people may say about your teaching skills. If the student's not learning, in my opinion, the teacher's not teaching. The second thing on Jesus and compassion had to do with Jesus' compassion in his warnings. Jesus was compassionate in his warnings. Look at verse 19 in chapter 13. From now, on, from now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. The point he's trying to make, my friends, is warnings. This warning that's going out, if remembered, helps acceptance of situations. I'm sure each and every one of you can think back of a time when your parents warned you to do or not to do something. Whether you did it or not, when the event occurred, you can remember that they said, do this or don't do that. And it had a greater significance in you accepting not only their credibility, but the credibility of the situation. Also, compassion is warnings in verses 30, 36 through 38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a cock shall, crow, shall not crow until you deny me three times. Friends, warnings, when ignored, can have painful, painful lessons. As we've all remember doing things and coming to our parents and saying, well, so and so is doing it. The parent says, well, if they put their finger in the fire, you're going to put yours in the fire? Warnings that we ignore can be very painful. In verses 21 through 27, we find Jesus' warning uh, being validating the results of, of his warning. When Jesus said, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breast one of the disciples whom Jesus loved, Simon Peter. Therefore gestured to him, John, and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel and took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, and, and after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Jesus asked him, said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, no one of these reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that he would say to him, Buy the things that we have need of for the feast, or else what he should give something to the poor. And soon after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. And it was night. Warnings, when remembered, to validate the results. Jesus had given the warnings, and when those came about, it gave even more credibility to what he had been teaching them. Friends, we don't want to confuse compassionate warnings with our painful disregard of warnings. The third thing has to do with the compassion of Jesus has to do with Jesus compassionate in his acceptance. In his acceptance. Reading from verse 31 through 33 of chapter 13. When therefore he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. 
If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I'm with you but a little longer. You shall seek me, and as I said to the Jews, I now say to you also, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, that is loving one another, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus was compassionate in his acceptance. His acceptance of his divinely appointed hour. Nobody knew when Jesus was going to be with the Father or lay down his life except God. Acceptance of this time when he would be glorified through his death, resurrection, and ascension. Acceptance from a human point of view meant very much suffering. Acceptance from the divine point of view meant glory to God. Acceptance that he would soon <clears throat> leave this world, that he would return to the Father who sent him having finished his work on earth. I have a note here that I want you to pay special attention to. When the servant of God is in the will of God, he is immortal until his work is done. The servant of God is when the servant of God is in the will of God. He is immortal until his will, will is done. In other words, if you're doing what God wants you to do, if you're in God's will completely, you're not leaving this earth till God calls you home, no matter what is going on anywhere. They could not even arrest Jesus, let alone kill him until the right hour had arrived. And this is so with God's service today. When the servant of God is doing the will of God, God gets the glory. The fourth thing I have to do with compassion is compassion about his teachings. Compassion about his, excuse me, his timing. Verses, go over to chapter 14, if you will. Beginning in verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, talking to Jesus, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Now that's a, a legitimate question, but in Jesus' mind it had all to do with timing. And it was compassionate in his timing. In laying the groundwork for this, if you look at verse 23, it says, If anyone loves me, will keep my word in our abode, our house, the Father and the Son will be with them. An additional groundwork is in verse 24. If anyone does not keep my word, they do not love me. In our house, our abode will not be with them. And those two verses lay the groundwork for the perfect timing in verse 25 and 26. 25 reads, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. In other words, he was with his people. He was declaring he was in, in the house, as it were, with them. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Jesus Christ was leaving so the Holy Spirit could come. The Holy Spirit was not coming until Jesus left. It was in a perfect timing. And in verse 29, And now I have told you this before it comes to pass, that when it comes to pass, you may believe. Once again, Jesus in his perfect timing is giving us this perfect warning, this perfect teaching, this perfect acceptance the last point on his compassion is his promise to return. If you would, take your Bibles over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to a really hopefully familiar passage to all of you, beginning in verse 13. Paul is teaching those at Thessalonica who were afraid of what was going to happen because some of their believers had already died. And they were thinking that Jesus would return while they were all there, uh, and that was not happening. So Paul teaches, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. And next two verses is where the meat's coming. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who, then we who are here alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. My friends, Jesus is compassionate in his promise to return. He's coming back. And no matter what you may hear, and the world situation right now seems to be primed for it, but the bottom line is no one knows but God when Jesus is going to return. But the promise is, is he's going to. And when he does, the believers are going to be called up to him. But until he does return, here's what we need to focus on. Salvation means we're going to heaven. But submission means that heaven is comes to us. Charles Spurgeon once said, little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Your heart can become a heaven on earth as you commune with God and worship with him daily, even hourly. Being grateful for even this pandemic as it is. Folks, one of the things that we need to remember during this crisis is that while we may be disconnecting, may be disconnected even, it doesn't surprise God. It's not a mystery to Him. Nothing gets by a totally sovereign, all-knowing God. So how about this thought then? If this disconnect is part of God's plan and we're in it, then the reconnect will also be His plan. Maybe we need to be disconnected so we can be reconnected better, stronger than ever. So when everything is over, said, and done, there's only two questions that need to be answered. You need to get your arms around these two questions because no matter what's going on out there, no matter what you hear, these two questions are the most critical. The first one, do you know God? Do you know God? And I don't mean do you know about God. I don't mean have you read on some Facebook page some trivial junk that somebody's writing about who God is, but do you know the true, all-creator, all-knowing, omniscient God? The God that's everywhere. The God that loves you in spite of yourself. Do you actually know Him? And the second question, can you face eternity with Him? Is your heart, soul, mind, and body ready to be with Him when He calls you? Let's pray. Almighty, holy God, as we wind up this lesson in your compassion for us, I pray, Lord, that of those that will take the time and energy to focus on these lessons that you put in your word, these demonstrations, these examples, will get their arms around in a way, Lord, that will change who they are. If there's one out there, Lord, that has heard today and has never made that commitment, does not really know you in their heart, that they'll reach out to you this day. In your son's name we pray, amen. Friends, if you fall in that category today and you don't know God, we have a webpage, www.norlinabaptistchurch.org. Go on that page. There's contact information. We bless our heart in any way that we can to reach out to you and help you get to know God. Thank you. May you have a blessed day.